What I wanted to do today was to talk about something that I talked about recently in a conference in Canberra, which is trying to put this whole issue about what's happening in the policy area into a context. I think that's important because we very often, when we're trying to lobby for change, get the feeling that what's happening now is what's always been happening or it is just getting worse from where it was, without a real sense of context. And I think at the moment what's happening to particularly welfare policy is, is a jump back into the 19th century virtually. We're moving back to the idea that people who are on welfare in a sort of very Malthusian way are people who can't control their sexual appetites, their financial appetites and all of their other appetites and therefore they need to be controlled. It's a very paternalistic, primitive, boring view of what the welfare sector is about and the indication of that is that last week they actually passed the healthy welfare card thing which I think is the beginning of a whole new push to increase the controls over the money that people get when they're in, on any form of government payments, particularly working age payments and it's interesting they aim it at the working age people. So to put this in context, I want to go back to this because I think we've had recently is out of character for what we've had in the, in most of the 20th century. If you go back to the 20th century, and I'm old so I remember a lot of this, but it's important to sort of see this in context, is that after World War II, we had a country that looked at what had happened in the Depression. Now that's really important, because what happened in the Depression here and overseas was the rise of a whole lot of extremist political movements. The one that took main control was the fascist movement, and that's where Hitler came from, and Mussolini. We had it in Australia as well to some degree. But also there were communist movements and various other movements and so on, which really undermined the idea of a democratic process. So after World War II, what we had in most countries, including Australia, was the introduction, really solid introduction of the idea of the welfare state. There was a very strong commitment to us all putting our money into taxes of people actually gov paying government in a sense to take the risks and to do things so that you didn't have disaffected people who had no income who were likely to sign up for extremist movements. It's a way of creating to some degree conservatism but it also uh, in a way creating a level of stability that meant that we actually believed that the governments we had even if we didn't always agree with them were trying to do a good job and what we had to do was change the way that they saw it. So after World War II, under Labour, you got the welfare state, you got unemployment benefits, with expansions of various uh, education type things, we got various other sorts of welfare payments and so on. Went into the Menzies era where they again improved housing, improved uh, university education, did various other things and there was a very solid belief that the role of government was there was to take care of the people and to provide those services which people needed to live decently. And there was a very strong sense that this is what Australia was about. We had that history, apart from the fact that we screwed Aboriginal people and we're Chinese people and we're racist and pigs in those sorts of ways. But in other ways there was a sense that Australia was a place which was the working man's paradise, I think it was referred to in various stages where we had a basic wage, where we had a guarantee that people couldn't live well. So that was carried through afterwards too, and then it went into chains around 60s and 70s, which people spend a lot of time talking about, which is when rights movements came up, when women's rights now got involved, and other sorts of rights were put on the agenda. And we had a very rapid sort of change, where we actually started questioning issues, but we had the Aboriginal uh, uh, referendum, where we had other ways of looking at differences and trying to create society that was a good society and the dominant view is I went back to university at that stage as a single parent on payments so I do have some experience at that end of things but that we actually went had the belief that we were creating a better society and all of the things one learned about were done in the things like sociology and political science which are social sciences and economics which is also a social science was a rather boring discipline that a few people actually took up and business courses were really very low status and there was a strong emphasis on the idea that we got together, paid our taxes and were entitled to certain types of payments and things but that started falling apart in the mid 70s but really took off in the 80s when uh, sort of corporations became international and stopped feeling that they had to support the nation state and really pushed against the idea 
that the public sector was there as a universal provider and tried to cut it down so it was only there for poor people and for people who were incompetent and cope. This is the basis of what we call a liberalism on the market model. And something there that went seriously wrong with the policy making in Australia. Unfortunately, it happened under a late government initially because Keating believed that the economy, if you got the levers right, he used to say, it'll do what it's supposed to do. So we had a lot of economic reform, but a lot of it undermined totally all of those reforms we've had in the post-war period, all of those things that made Australia a more civilised society. So I think that we're pushing for the sorts of changes that you've been talking about and you're going to continue talking about. We've got, remember, this is still part of our recent history and our basic traditions of trying to create a fair go. We need to connect it up because I think younger people in particular don't know it was ever thus. They think that the sorts of crap that we've got at the moment is the sort of crap which is actually creating, a, you know, which, which has always been around. This is normal. So we hope that it's not normal. We want to change the idea it's normal. We want to actually start looking at what, what is happening in the sector. We need to look at what's happening in the economy generally. And we need to remind people, and this is my slogan at the moment, that we live in a society, not an economy. And economics is a means by which we pay for things. It is not the dominant way that we make decisions. Now that's very important because recently we've had a whole lot of debates, including some which have involved people like ACOS and some of the welfare sector, where people have looked at summits on this and summits on that and trying to make things look better. But they're all based on the idea that the only thing we can do is increase the size of the economy and then maybe we can redistribute some of the resources to the poor and the disadvantaged and the people that aren't doing so well. But it's done with a very different sort of viewpoint. It's done within a context of people not really believing that we have a system in Australia that sorts people out into basically winners and losers, if we're going to be absolutely open about it all. That we actually have structural differences which make it really difficult for people to do things. Because we've had 26 years since the last time we had a recession. So we've had 26 years of economic growth and nobody has done much redistribution. In fact, the redistribution that's been occurring over this last period is redistribution to the rich, not to the poor. So the idea that we would have decent welfare payments, the idea that we would have decent wages for low-income people and working conditions, a lot of that stuff has really come into question because we've had this so-called neoliberal revolution. Now, why am I talking about this? I'm talking about it because I think we need to recognise that that neoliberal crap that's been hanging over our heads for the last 40 nearly years is actually on the way out. If you take a look at what's happening in Europe and take a look to some degree what's happening here, there's a lot of movement away from the two major parties who've become centrist parties, who've become boringly similar, unfortunately, in too many, far too many ways. Young people, there's about a million young voters that haven't even bothered registering to vote because they just don't, they can't, they can't see that democracy is actually working really well at the moment because the major parties are talking a lot of crap that bores them shitless. There's a whole lot of other people that are voting informal now. The rates of voting informal are much higher in Australia than they've been anywhere else, uh, than they've been in previous years because people don't feel it's worth voting. We've lost that sense, which was around, that even if you disagreed with the government, it was probably trying within its own context to do the right thing by other people and you could change the ways it goes. And one of the reasons people don't believe change is possible is because, unfortunately, the two major parties tend to mirror each other on a lot of the areas that are important to us. They've taken the social almost entirely off the agenda and replaced it with the economic. So you get the Labour Party and the coalition arguing about how we create more growth, how we create more wealth, how we do better for business, how we do better for the, the workers who've got the jobs, and how we sort of completely ignore the fact that we've become a more unequal country over the last 30 to 40 years. The people at the top have benefited from it, the people at the bottom have benefited slightly but not nearly as much, so the inequality has grown. And what, what inequality does is it creates feelings of insecurity. I mean, we know we're unequal. We know there's differences between us. 
So when inequality is seen as unfair, it's seen as doing people over, then people get the sheets. Because then, particularly people at the lower end, feel whatever they do, they're going to be stuck because there's really no way out of what they're doing. They have no sense of agency, no sense of power, no sense of being represented by anybody who's in Parliament. And they feel as though they're abandoned. And a lot of people give up and decide they might as well get pissed because what's the point in doing anything else? A lot of people don't. Most don't. And they try really hard to do the right thing. And they find constantly they're frustrated because they can't get jobs, because they're not seen as appropriate for the jobs. All of those things that keep happening that make them feel bad about what's going on and make them feel disengaged. And at the moment, the government is feeding into that, and unfortunately, the Labour Party is as well. So we had income management in the Northern Territory initially, then the Labour government spread out. We've now got the so-called cashless welfare debit card, which is happening in Sedona, not far from where you're meeting. And that really is bad because it's actually punishing an entire community for the fact that they've got a certain number of people who have alcohol and drug problems. I think the percentage is something like 10 to 15 percent of the population that receives the income support, yet they're going to put it on everybody. So 80 percent goes into a card, so you can't just pop down and buy something at the local store, go to the local bank. You've got no money in your pocket. You feel impotent. You feel as though you're being treated like an idiot child. This is a very different sort of policy. But it's also to some degree a sign that things are being undermined. They wouldn't have tried something like this a few years ago. They've really got themselves stuck in this sort of neoliberal conservative crap that's going on. And that's turning people off them. We've got the foundation now of various sort of nutty racist parties coming here. But if you look at Europe, you get a real sense where they've had much higher unemployment than we have and much more consistent lack of growth. You've got a lot of these parties like uh, Syriza in Greece, Podemos in Spain and so on, who are good left-wing parties. You've just had the British Labour Party elect a sort of an old-fashioned socialist, but well, there's almost as old as I am, who actually is saying, let's get back to some sort of decent left-wing policies. And everybody's having vague hysterics about the fact that, he, that people actually like it. Those are showing some interest, that they're joining the Labour Party and becoming supporters. You've got it in various other parts of Europe that that sort of stuff is happening, but at the same time, you've got on the outside, you've got things like UKIP and the various writing parties, Golden Door, who are saying, we've got to get rid of strangers, we've got to get rid of migrants, we've got to get rid of other people. What we're going to do is play the patriotic things, which is very reminiscent of some of the stuff that was happening in the 1930s. Why do I talk about it? Why does it worry me? It was unfortunately born in the 1930s from Jewish parents in a country taken over by Hitler. So I know from my own personal history what happens when these anti groups take over. So I think we're in the middle of a shift. So it means what we've got to do, and this is the reason I'm talking about this, is we've got to start putting the dots together. We've got to look at what's happening to all the people there who are unemployed. What's happening to the single parents? What's happening to the outreach, to the indigenous groups, to the refugees, all of the people who are seen as outsiders and not productive in gross domestic products. I mean, gross domestic products is a meaningless thing. It's, it's gross, it's not domestic, it's not productive. All it does is measure our trade is good. It doesn't look at social contributions. It doesn't look at unpaid work. It doesn't look at creative endeavors unless you can sell them and you can call yourself the art industry. It doesn't look at helping the neighbours. It doesn't look at what good community is about. It doesn't look at relationships between people, and it certainly doesn't look at issues like ethics and behaving well. All of those things don't fit economics. They're all called externality. So I think we've got to really start thinking very clearly about the sort of world that we want to live in, about creating, and I did the Boyer picture, someone might remember, on what was called my college civil society with the ABC radio lectures that are running at the moment. I did them 20 years ago. And I said, if we keep going down this neoliberal crap area, we are going to end up with a very uncomfortable society, not a more civil society, a less civil society, and we really have. So we need to sit down and look for the positives. We need to try and create an image of the sort of Australia that most of us want to live in. In fact, a lot of people want to live in it, but they're not being offered it. 
They don't talk about social policy in the party, unless they're talking about screwing the unemployed. They don't talk about good community services. They don't talk about childcare services that are for kids. It's only for getting others into the work. Fine if you want to get a job. But kids need childcare for lots of other reasons, and mothers sometimes are providing a whole lot of care that they can't actually take on a full-time job. There's lots of things that we need to put back on the political agenda. But I think it's important that those of us who care about this should start talking to each other and start putting together a political agenda that makes for a good society, that puts together some optimism. One of the problems that we have at the moment is that if you make people too pessimistic, and I think it's happening with a lot of people, they go for the doona politics. I'm going home to bed and I'm pulling the doona over my head, it's all too bloody hard. They're not going to give up anything because they don't trust the politicians to do the right thing by them. They're not going to care about their neighbours unless they're people they know that look like them and talk like them. They're going to hate outsiders and blame them for everything because it has to be somebody's fault and they can't work out what's happening. That's the sort of political environment we're running up to the next election in. And I think what we've got to do is put our heads together and decide what policies we really want. One of the really important things about changing policies, and I've had some success over the last 30, 40 odd years that I've been an activist, is you need not only to criticise and confront and protest, you need to think about what we could put there instead. What's missing from the debate at the moment? There are very few groups who are actually putting up alternatives. Most of the people are putting up critics. It's important that we do it, because you can't trust the people who are the advocates now because they are, they're part of the system, unfortunately. They're caught up with it. Most of the major voluntary agencies get most of their, uh, uh, their, their income from governments. They're not prepared to be too rude or too difficult or too pushy. We need people at the grassroots working with people who've got maybe some additional skills of understanding how policy makes. We've got to actually put up the alternatives. We've got to start thinking about what a good payment system would look like, which recognises social contributions as well as financial and economic contributions. We need to start doing that and we need to put it up and we need to put it up there so that voters know there's alternatives so that politicians know that voters know there's alternatives, so that we can convince them that there are alternatives to the crap that they've been feeding us in terms of social policy for the last 20 to 30 years. We need to do it because otherwise they drown us out by crapping on about how important the economic is, which really ignores all of those things that are really important, which is relationships, ethics and goodwill, living in a good society, caring about your neighbours, being respected, being able to make a contribution and being able to be part of a good society.